Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. This week we kickstart a two-part series, a masterclass on a segment or a, you know a topic that everyone is interested in, but most people don't know about and want to learn: the futures and options space. Yes, we'll help you understand the basics of the derivatives markets and how you can make money in the FNO space. And joining us today is our guest, who's a veteran in this space, Tushar Mahajan, the head of derivatives at Centrum Broking, joins in. Tushar, thanks so much for being with us on the show. You know, this is a fairly complex. Complex and technical topic, but a lot of young uh, traders and investors want to get into it. As per the feedback that we've got across our social media platforms, so before we start learning about this space, uh, what would your advice be to uh, you know those young traders who are interested to get into this space now? I think one of my key advices to people who are new to the market and trying to enter the space. is that you need before trading you need to understand your risks very well especially in the futures market which allows you for a lot of leverage as well you know the leverage makes your gains uh, look very good but at the same time they can mag- magnify your losses on the you know if a trade goes wrong so understand your risks don't get too tempted by leverage and most importantly have a stop loss every time that you trade Okay so understand your risks and don't get too tempted that's the advice from Tushar but let's begin from the beginning right Tushar if someone has just started off and they don't know anything about the derivatives market um the pure definition of futures and options what would it be what would your explanation be to them so in a very in a very simple layman's terms i would say that futures is basically the price of an asset which the market is willing to give it at a specified date in future so for example let's say in tata motors the the spot is the stock is trading at 132 and the futures is trading at 132.5 for an expiry on the 29th of october mm. this basically means that as of today the market feels uh, is willing to give a price of 132.5 to the to the underlying asset which is tata motors mm. on 29th of october 2020 and when it comes to options mm. uh, options is an instrument which basically allows the buyer either a right to buy or sell a particular stock at a, a particular asset at a particular price on a specified date mm. so for example you know uh, going with the same example of tata motors mm. uh, a, co- a buyer of a tata motors call option at a certain specific uh, of a strike of 135 is basically buying the right to buy tata motors at 135 mm. irrespective of the market price on the day of expiry which is 29th of october mm. and he obviously to get that right he is ha- he has to pay something which is called the option premium Okay so when so this is the basic layman's definition of futures and options. Okay now there is a lot of jargon that you've used right I mean there's open interest there's cost of carry uh we'll get into the details but if you just want to demystify some of the most important terms that are used in the futures and options space which ones would they be? Sure so I think uh at, at a very bare minimum to two terms which are really important uh when you understand when you are looking at the futures market specifically mm. is the cost of carry and open interest mm. uh we'll take each of them one by one so what does cost of carry mean the cost of carry is basically the net cost which you have to pay in order to hold an asset to maturity mm. so going by the same example of uh, you know tata motors the stock price is 132 the futures price is 132.5 mm. so the difference which is 0.5 is the cost which you have to pay in order to hold that asset until uh, maturity. Uh, until maturity which is 29th of october mm. so so that is basically what is cost of carry and if you calculate it in terms of percentages that would be about 0.38 or 0.4% is the cost that the cost that you're hold, uh, paying to hold the premium okay. so that is what is cost of carry okay. the other more kind of complicated term or difficult to understand is what is open interest mm. in plain english o- open interest is defined as the number of open contracts mm. in the market for a particular asset at any point in time mm. uh remember that for every contract there will always be a buyer and there will always be a seller mm. uh so you know t- 
total number of open contracts between a buyer and seller, they define an open interest. Okay. I think we could probably take an example uh, to explain how this works. Yeah. Uh, let's say there are you know, a couple of people in the market, A, B, C, D, E. Mm. So now, uh, between, let's say A buys a contract and B sells a contract to him. Mm. So between A and B, there is one contract which is open, mm. and so the open interest is one. Mm. Now tomorrow, C and D trade between themselves. So C buys six contracts, and D sells six contracts to uh, C. C. So there are six contracts between C and D, and there was one contract in the market earlier between A and B. So now your open interest totally becomes seven. seven. So one contract which was where A had bought it and B had sold it, and six contracts which C had bought and D had sold, so that makes it a total interest of seven. Mm. Further, you know, continuing with this transaction, mm. A sells a contract to D. Now, which means A sells one and D buys one. Mm. When, what that makes it, that the one contract which A already held with himself is now nullified to zero, mm. And similarly, the six contracts, out of the six contracts which D was holding short, he has bought one from A, so D also has now only five contracts. Mm. So in this marketplace, which has four participants, which is A, B, C, and D, the open interest now, which is the number of open contracts, mm. is, is only six, mm. because one contract now has ex extinguished by an indirect transaction between A and D. Mm. Let's add another layer and let's introduce another person E into this. Mm. Now person E sells six contracts to, uh, uh, sorry, person C buys six contracts from C. Mm. So C was holding six contracts which he had bought two days back and now he sold them off to E. So in the overall marketplace of ours, which has A, B, C, D, and E, C holds nothing right now, mm -hmm. and all his positions get shifted to, uh, to E. So still in total, the overall open interest, or the op overall uh, positions which stay, continue to be six. Okay. That is what is defined as open interest, which is the number of unopened, uh, you know, unnetted contracts in the market. So basically, it's just to understand the demand supply dynamics between uh, within stocks, right, among different players. Absolutely, okay. but unlike a stock where you know, uh, you know, unlike equity, which is a fixed amount which is issued by the company, the open interest is just two contracts between two people trading with them with themselves. So there is no, so to say, you know, theoretical limit to how many contracts the uh, marketplace can have. Okay, so you've explained to us the two key definitions, which is cost of carry and open interest as well. You explained very beautifully, but it is still a bit technical, right? So if you can tell us how does one decipher data in the future segment? I mean, how at the, at the end of the day, it's all about making money. So how do you decipher the data? Sure. Uh, so the way we kind of look at the futures data in a very uh, basic sense is that you always look at data in conjunction to the price movement of the underlying assets. Mm. Uh, so you know we'll, we'll talk about a very simple uh, kind of methodology that let's say the price of a stock is going up mm -hmm. and open interest is also going up. Mm. So like you, you spoke about the demand supply dynamic, this basically means that there are more people who are willing to buy the contract in the market mm. And as a result, the position is going up. Right. Uh, and, which, and this is now coinciding with the price movement. So what this means is that on the underlying asset, there is a long bias, and we called it a long built up uh, on the asset which is happening. Right. Now, let's say the price continues to go up, but the open interest is coming down. Right. What does that mean? That while the price is going up, there are people who are willing to cancel their contracts. Right. Uh, and the fact that the price is going up means that you know peop, uh, the contracts are being cancelled. You know the demand would be on the short for the short contracts to be uh, covering their positions. Mm -hmm. So this is a situation where you see that there is short covering happening in the stock. Mm -hmm. The price goes up and uh, the open interest comes down. Mm -hmm. Now let's assume a, a different scenario where you know the price is also going down and the open interest is also going down. Which means, you know, the fact that price is going down means that there are more people who are uh, sellers on the stock, and the fact that open interest is coming down in conjunction with the price, 
It means that people who held those positions, they are selling off the contracts which they have. Mm -hmm. So this is called unwinding of the long trade. Mm -hmm. So exact opposite to what we saw in the first situation where the price was going up and the open interest was going up as well. Okay. Now let's assume that the price continues to come down and the open interest is going up. Now in such a situation, this is you know, clearly that there is a pressure on the stock where the price is moving and there are more and more people willing to open contracts at a lower price. So which means that you know, the stock is beginning to see some short positions getting built up and uh, this is the opposite of you know, what we saw in the covering space. Okay, and depending on what your risk-taking ability is, Tushar, uh, who are the key market participants in the FNO space? So broadly speaking, we look at three people who are three uh, participants in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. They are the speculators, the arbitragers, and the hedgers. Mm -hmm. So in terms of risk profiling, you know, the speculators would, would be the highest risk-taking guys. They are people who speculate or who take funds on the prices of the underlying assets. These guys are typically liquidity providers, uh, liquidity seekers, and you know, let's say they assume that the stock is going to go up, they would come in and buy positions in the market. The other category, which I would say is moderate risk uh, people, are the hedgers. Again, they are liquidity seekers in the market, and hedgers are basically people who are looking to hedge their existing positions uh, you know, in the underlying market for a short-term blip. You know, just as an example, let's say Hero Motors and Bajaj Auto both uh, move in a similar manner that they're, they're given the fact that they are in the same industry or something. And I have a core position in Hero Motor. Mm -hmm. As a hedger, I would look, probably want to hedge some kind of uh, risk to the two-wheeler market, so to say, by selling Bajaj Auto uh, futures. Mm -hmm. So that is what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm hedging my existing risk in the market. The third category, which basically complements both hedgers and speculators, and they are the lowest risk, is the arbitragers. Mm. These are guys who would basically try and be in the market to kill any kind of inefficiencies which the price action or price movements of the first two categories try to create in the market. Mm. So for example, someone is buying, uh, bidding futures aggressively for a stock because he believes that the stock can go up. The arbitrager would come into the market, he would buy the stock, and he would start selling the futures to make sure that the cost of carry between the stock and the futures does not change too significantly, okay. or is not priced out of whack. So those are the arbitragers who are the low risk, but liquidity providers in the market, and all three categories have their own functions. Okay, so you've uh, created a very good base for our next discussion. I mean, you've explained to us what the basic definitions are, who are the kind of people that participate in this market. But what I want to know is what's the payoff, right? I mean, how do you really make money using derivatives and the FNO segment? So we'll do one thing. We'll take a very quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll also focus on the option segment where we come back and try to demystify more of this jargon and more of the FNO space on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Sixty percent of India's citizens lived in areas with no bank. Hi guys, welcome back. You're still watching Smart Money on CNBC TV 18. We've kick-started a two-part series to understand and do a deep dive into the futures and options space. Before the break, Tushar Mahajan of Centrum Broking spoke about the basics of futures. Let's now talk about some strategies and money-making ideas, right? Tushar, now that we know the basics of futures, tell us what are options and can you simplify options for us with some basic strategies just for you know, our viewers to understand? Sure. So at the very basic, options consist of, there are two types of options, which is call options and put options. Like I said in the first segment that the options basically give the buyer a right to buy or sell a stock at a predefined price and on a predefined date. So the call option by the buyer of a call option is gets the right to buy a stock at a specific price on a specific date uh, as defined by the option parameters. The buyer of a put option on the other hand gets the right to sell a sell the underlying asset, sell a stock 
at a specified price and a specif on a specified date. So these are the very basic definitions of what is a put option, what is a call option, and what is a put option. Mm. And for to buy this right, you have to pay a premium, which is called the option premium. So at the very basic, this is how you know options work. And we'll just quickly delve into what are the payoffs uh, for an option buyer and what are the payoffs of, for an option seller. Mm. Uh, in the future space, you know, the payoffs are fairly linear. They are largely dependent on how the underlying asset is moving. And you know, uh, accordingly, uh, the cost of carry as the time to maturity happens. In the case of options, however, the pricing is not linear because you've basically bought a right to uh, buy or sell a stock at a specified price. Mm. So for an option buyer, for example, we'll go with the first example of Tata Motors. Mm. Let's say today I buy an op the stock price of Tata Motors, let's say, is trading at 132. Mm. I, bought, I think that on the day or date of expiry, which is 30, uh, 29th of October, the, pr uh, the uh, Tata Motors price will be more than 132. Mm or let's say more than 135. So I buy an option of a strike price of 135. Mm. I have to pay a premium for that. Let's assume the premium is one rupee. So I pay one rupee and I get the right to buy the stock at 135. Mm. Now on the date of expiry, if the spot goes to 140, I am basically buying a stock which is currently in the market for 140 mm. at 135 by paying rupee one. So my only downside as of now is that one rupee which I've paid, whereas my upside could be limited because the stock could be 150, 160, 170. So depending on the stock price, that's where my upside is. Okay, got that. So uh, what are now, the- Now, if I was yeah. an option- Sure. No, I just want to ask you, yeah. what are the factors which determine the price of options, these options that you're speaking about? Yes, so uh, multiple factors would determine the price of the option. Mm. The first obviously would be the strike price. So the farther the strike price goes from the current price, the lower would be the price. Mm. The other option which uh, determines the price, the other factor which determines the price of an option is the time to maturity. The longer is the time available for maturity, the higher is the price that you are going to pay because you're keeping that right for a longer period of time. The third factor, significantly which impacts the price of options is the volatility in the market. Suppose the stock, because you're buying a right and the stock is a, let's say a very volatile stock which is calculated in terms of implied volatility, the price of the option would be higher. Uh, if I were to compare, let's say a Tata Motors to an HDFC bank which relatively has smaller moves, the volatility for Tata Motors would be more and for the same difference from the strike price, the price, the, uh, the price of a Tata Motors option would be far more than the HDFC bank option. Mm. And the other factors which are largely static uh, would be interest rates and dividends. They would impact the price, of this, uh, uh, the price of the options, but because they're largely independent for the entire market, you would, uh, you know, in okay. your everyday trading, focus on the three other factors, which is strike time and uh, volatility okay strike time and volatility are a couple of key factors uh, to watch out for but what are the different option strategies that one can really take and what kind of risks do a call buyer and a call writer take so the call buyer like i said uh, 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 an option buyer which could be either a call or a put buyer mm. is the for him the risk is limited to the amount of premium that he is paying mm. so for a for a small amount of risk for a fixed amount of risk your gains could be unlimited because the stock could be anywhere. Mm. On the other side, for the option writer, which is either a call writer or a put writer, mm. your upfront earning is the only gain which you will make, mm. but your risks could be significantly uh, higher because you, you are opening yourself to a large amount of losses if the, if, if the trade goes in the other way. So I, I'll just quickly, you know, talk about the op, the option writers pay off in the case of the Tata Motors example that we did. That I, I got one rupee by writing a call option of 135, mm. but the stock has moved to 140. So my ver, f, for a strike price of 135, mm. so my loss of five rupees is what I would have to pay to the option buyer. Mm. So for a ultimate gain of one rupee, I have exposed myself to five rupees of loss. And that five could be 15, 20, 25, whatever mm. the number be, as the case may be in terms of the date of expiry.
Okay, so. so so what you have to understand that for buyers the price the uh, gains are uh, the gains are unlimited for a fixed cost, mm. whereas for the writers the the losses are unlimited for a fixed gain. Okay, but if now I, if I want to write if someone wants to write a com fairly complex strategy, uh, how does one do it? I mean, if you can give us some examples. So I, I think uh, in the options world, there are a multiple of uh, different strategies and permutations and combinations which use. Mm. In the interest of time, we'll just keep them limited to, you know, we've discussed the basic call buying and call selling. We'll now speak about, uh, you know, strategies like a call spread. So for example, at the stock price is trading at 132 today. I believe that the stock will go up from here, let's say beyond 135. But I'm very certain that it cannot go up at 145. So as a, as a trader, you know, my view could be that I will go and buy a call option of 135 and internally sell a call option of 145. Mm. So what that means is I have reduced my cost of buying the option by selling an upside call. And at the same time, I have given up any further upside beyond 145 in the stock. So by paying the option premium, I, can, I have the chance to play the option from 135 to 145. Similarly, if I'm a put buyer and I believe that the stock is going to go to 120 but not below 110, I could buy a put of 120 and sell a put of 110, thereby reducing my cost of trading the option but at the same time giving up some of my gains because I'm limited, limiting myself to only 10 rupees of gains between 120 to 110. So that could be one. The other option, you know, like we said, that volatility is a key aspect which determines option prices. Mm. Suppose the, pri the stock is trading at 135, and I believe that the stock is ready for a big move. I don't know which side the move is going to be, either on the upside or the downside. I could buy a call and a put both of, uh, of the option uh, and pay a certain price for that. And let's assume that the price you know, falls down to 120. Hmm. So my put is, let, I, if I bought the 135 put, I make money on that, which is 15 rupees, and my call expires worthless. Similarly, on the other side, if the price goes to 150, uh, you know, I make money on the call option, but my put, uh, so I didn't know what the direction was, but I made money by buying both a okay. call and a put, and that's called a straddle. All right, so you know what, we've actually run out of time. I know this is a really exhaustive topic and you've managed to sort of explain it to us beautifully, all the terms, the key definitions, the risks involved. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up on this first episode of a two-part series of uh, Smart Money where our focus is on the futures and options space. But next week we'll be back with a follow-on. So don't go anywhere. Keep watching CNBC TV 18. Tushar, thank you so much for joining us on the show. And you guys have a good weekend. Thanks a lot.